Uh, I am representing Enterprise Estonia here in Norway and uh, their investment agency. We have our office here in the building. Uh, I have two colleagues working with exports and I'm primarily focused on uh, investments to Estonia. Uh, tomorrow there will take place at the Spectrum uh, Paranoia Watch com Conference, which are a deep tech cybersecurity event going on for two days. Uh, I got in connection with the um, Startup White Skies, who have this Cyber North accelerator ready to partner up with um, possible partners in Norway. And uh, we decided that we could have this pre event in front of uh, Paranoia. So we will have an interesting um, presentation from uh, Startup White Skies, and they're also bringing in um, their uh, companies in the accelerator. Uh, why do Estonia focus on cybersecurity? It's maybe because they are one of the most digital countries in the world with a high level of a uh, lot of services to uh, the both public uh, public services and also private services to uh, to uh, their uh, individuals and, and um, with their um, reputation uh, and uh, development, they have become among the leaders in uh, cybersecurity development in, in, in uh, the world. Um, they had this incident in 2007 where uh, they were shut down for almost three weeks with all digital uh, services. They couldn't get uh, money out of the uh, ATMs, so they could buy stuff in the, the grocery stores, and uh, there were a, a lot of uh, situations that take a lot of time. After that, they put cybersecurity on the top uh, priority in regards to uh, make and secure and safe uh, e service standards to, toward the audience. Uh, that with that development, also they have uh, been, uh, they have got a lot of attention from uh, around the world. Also, the NATO Corporate Cyber Defense Center is situated in Tallinn, together with the European IT Agency. So, uh, in order to uh, remain innovative and effective and successful uh, as a northern country. Estonia has continued to execute their vision of becoming a safe and secure e-state with automatic e-services available 24-7. And uh, there's a lot of uh, good examples of what is going on in Estonia that we maybe all, we don't have, we haven't developed it yet. We have it maybe only on the, as a plan in Norway. Among the best uh, thing I like to talk about is their e-residency solution where people globally can be like an e-resident of Estonia. They can start their company through Estonia and then they also have access to the EU, uh, EU countries, EU market. Uh, regarding security, they also have invented this uh, data embassy. Uh, that means they have all their e-services, all their um, most important infrastructure available outside their own country. So if they will have like a nature uh, disaster or a, a huge cyber attack, they can uh, also run their country outside their own borders. And that's among the most innovative uh, ideas uh, I have heard of. And it's a new idea. So uh, I'm quite proud to uh, represent this country. And uh, we will have a program today with some of my partners here in Norway. And we will end up with Southern Wise Guys presenting their uh, Southern North uh, Accelerator. Uh, we will start to uh, welcome uh, Jörnland Mathisen, uh, founder of uh, Oslo International Hub and uh, Nurban. And uh, he will say a few words. Thank you. Thank you. Do you know what we normally say when we welcome people from abroad in this house? 
we say welcome home. So welcome home, guys. I girls. <laughs> it's actually uh, quite important. Those words are caref carefully chosen because this is, in essence, the house, the international house, as it's called, run by Oslo International Hub. It's an incubator focusing especially on expats and repats, internationals, internationally minded people. So the community consists of, depending on definition, 500 or 2,000 expats, repats, internationally minded people, most of which are in tech, startup, new biz, entrepreneurial space. Uh, and that's what the house is. Um, we have, as, a, as the incubator of the International Hub, we have evaluated 1,200 companies and helped 600 companies the last five years. And um, yeah, that's fun. I guess that's the short version. We might not be as wise as the startup wise guys, but you know, we, 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 we know something in the space. Um, so that was the hub. Um, welcome home. What does it mean? It means that we want you, if you sit in Perno or in Tallinn or in Tartu or wherever you sit, to think of, well, we actually have a home in Oslo. And what could that mean? It, it means primarily it means the thought that Oslo isn't a foreign place. Oslo is somewhere you can feel at home and you have a base to explore people and business opportunities. It could mean virtual office, have your office address here, pay this much, well, this much per month, and you have an office. And you pay for the post box, and you for meeting rooms whenever you happen to be here. So that makes it suddenly extremely easy to have an office abroad. And that's the idea. Everything is meant to be extremely easy, but in out of Norway or out of Norway for small businesses. Of course, meeting rooms and offices and hot desks and all of these sort of things, we also offer. So that's but the community is the most important. Now that was my one hat. I'm the founder, I'm the chairman, not the CEO. Pavel here in the back and several from the team are here. Pavel is in, in charge of this event because I'm also partly in charge of another event from my other hat that's running at the same time. So if I take one step to the side, that was the Jörn, the founder of Austin National Lab, the house. So now I take on my other role. I'm part-time Monday director of Business Angels Norway, till, uh, corresponding to Estban that many of you are still in the very well. So we have learned a lot from Estban. And we started later, we started three years ago. And uh, we're running the Nordic Angels program together with Estban, Fiban, and Alba. We are not Nuban because that those words were taken by a very old initiative that still owns the words. So we are business angels in Norway. <laughs> but same thing. Uh, so business angels in Norway is an association of business angels. I'm one. I am invested in circa 60 startups, small money, diversity. Uh, typically go in there and I'm not that papa try to help from as early as possible. So I'm not a late stage angel, I'm typically first angel or early stage angel. I've seen all the mistakes possible, I'm part of doing half of them, <laughs> and hopefully I've learned something. Um, I think my portfolio is about 10x now, so I must have learned something right. Well, somebody must have learned something right. If it's picking or if it's developing, I don't really know. Anyway, so we are 700 angels in 12 regional entities throughout Norway that together consist of business angels in Norway. The space is in formation and shaping in Norway. There are, there's a super angel group, there's an early VC that wants to also call themselves angels, so it's uh, not as structured and easy as in Estonia, where you have one. So, but we're, we're shaping. But it, it anyhow means that, well, yes, Norway is a country of a lot of people that have earned quite a bit of money on oil or this or that. And the premise for us working quite a bit in this though over the years is that there are a lot of Norwegians that should know about all the good brains and all the good tech going on in this area. And um, yes. So the idea is to today to bring together some 
Jill Somstarch at the in the room, meet some Estonian companies that are good, and um, see if we can make any leads and things out of that. That's the idea. Plan? Anything else I should have said? I don't know, man. Yeah. So to you. Yeah. Please, <laughs> that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Basic, pretty straightforward, pretty informal. We're approachable. I guess that's the most important message that I need to actually speak to say. Yeah. Thank you. You're always excellent to uh, get people in touch with each other. So uh, you know a lot of people. So uh, have a, a talk with him during the evening. Uh, next guy is also really efficient. Uh, he makes things happen. Uh, his name is Rune Elvrum and uh, representing Explorico. Welcome. accredited as company builders without us knowing it because that's what we did we, we help people we help people with uh, with genuine ideas and uh, we help them by utilizing something we have done each and every one of us for 25 years because we've been selling in the IT industry for 25 years and that skill is much needed in this e ecosystem so what we do is uh, actually that we are partaking and building the ecosystem in Norway. And uh, when we went to in enter into the scene, actually I remember the date because it was the 13th of December 2017. <coughs> we tried to fund our own company with uh, private investor capital. Well, that didn't go that well. So we knocked uh, quite a few doors in, in around Oslo, in Raufoss, in uh, Kongsberg. Rich people, you know, they would like to invest in technology. No, not at all. <laughs> so we went down to Lisbon to Web Summit. So we just, uh, I, I altered my sales strategy here. This is selling again. So I said to the Norwegian investors, I'm not that interested in your money. So we're going to Lisbon. To, to get some real money. So, and we'll tell you all about it when we come home. And I'll tell you that worked. <laughs> because when we then went down to Lisbon, a lot of meetings, I had 66 meetings in two days, quite efficient planning, doing all the right stuff. And then I met uh, this company, it's called Cloud Extract. And, uh, what I did was that I pitched uh, the pitch for, for, for my startup to, to all these 66 uh, investors. And I met this wonderful woman, uh, had her badge turned uh, inside out. And she was very interesting because she asked the right questions. Not about my product, but about the go-to-market model. So uh, actually she was the head of innovation for Google at that time. So uh, what happened was when we were leaving, I asked to scan her badge. So yeah, what's your name? Yeah, Paola from Google. Oh, head of innovation. You wouldn't by any chance know a kind of a hero of mine, mine which is Ray Kuchwey. He reports to me, he says. <laughs> Anyone here know Ray Kuchwey? He has uh, kind of predicted the future as, as we have, have it today. Since So he's like, uh, He's uh, the force behind Singularity University, you know that? So he's, he's kind of one of the <laughs> hidden features in the IT industry that actually have moved it in leaps. So it's quite interesting then to... So my go-to-market model 
which is an American company, which I still use at a lot of my startups today, that go-to-market model was adopted by Google. So now G Suite is the second largest uh, article on that marketplace, which meant that me, little, little Rune from Norway, I got a very high credibility in San Francisco where they sit. So, so um, I have a role now as curating startups, software-based, to go into this market, which can reach 35 million customers like this. So that's part of what we do. So we do uh, the growth part. When we take upon startups, we do it with a sweat equity focus in the start until you're funded, and then we can have some kind of reasonable re retainer uh, for, for our services. But it's the team, it's the first thing we look at, and it's about the scalability. By that, it means that you need to put people out of the equation. And to have a reasonable risk, that's why we build a portfolio. So if you look at, um, and what we actually do, as a sidekick and where we started was that we started making people making people meet in the same room. Ambitious people meet in the same room like this is important so that we talk. So we actually created an event called Oslo Big Data Day. Anybody heard about it? It's four time now, 1200 people at uh, BI. So it's, uh, now that's a corporate event. And in the autumn we have the Aim to North conference down at Oslo Met how to utilize AI, big data analytics, which is our, that's our hood, so to say. And we did, with Geirhan, we did uh, to the, together a hackathon uh, towards the last year's Oslo Innovation uh, Week. Garage 48. With Garage 48. And you know, when I met these Estonian people that we brought in there, well, then we just, we just created the rocket fuel to the innovation process. So there were 70 or 20 IDs. We were approximately 80 participants, 20 IDs. Seven of those IDs got members, and five of them are companies today. That's quite cool. And you get mentors from Skype, Pipe Drive, you know, unicorns. They use their uh, time on that. So, and in addition to that, we have an event where we meet all our investors the one that we hustled before we went to Lisbon. So we created something called uh, Investor Breakfast Club. So now this is a list where we actually show people out these days. You're not invested in startups, tech startups for a while, so you are not allowed to come. That actually makes them more eager to come, you know, if you play it a bit hard. So, uh, and if there's one thing I can teach you about sales, is to be a bit hard to get. You need to do it with a bit of brilliance. So, at our core, today we, are, we have a portfolio of 32 companies. So we have companies throughout Norway, Nordics, Estonia, Dublin, Malaysia, San Francisco. And uh, at our core, we have emerging tech. Everything we do is emerging tech. It's AR, VR, it's um, AI. Is big data analytics, is blockchain, or other types of distributed uh, ledger. And uh, it's about innovation processes, because your product isn't finished when you have the ID. No, that ID can alter. So the ideation process is quite uh, important. So let's see concrete what type of services we do uh, give to the, to the startups. Ideation to help out with formalizing the ideation, how to make money on this. And you know, 25 years in sales, you can make money on pretty much anything if you do smart. Uh, next thing is just to register a company in Norway. In comparison to, to Estonia, this is a hellhole, you know. It's, it's, in the worst case, you have two months waiting for the bank and then your uh, establishment document is expired, so you need to re-register again. So you use four or five months to create a company. And it's hideous because it's just lagging in every... And then we do a lot of business modeling, because when a founder comes to us, says, uh, I, am, I want to have a B2C business model. 
yeah, cool. We don't know anything about B2C, but we know a lot about B2G or B2B and how to create good business model and separate diff different revenue streams. Because revenue streams is at the core. And uh, those money are way cheaper than investor <coughs> money. We also help out with the uh, initial rounds of angel investments. For instance, I have a surgical lamp up here that is one of my startups. Who's their angel investors? Yeah, they're the surgeons because they are the future users. So we listed like one million Norwegian crowns within two or three days because this product fits these investors. And they didn't know they were business angels before we told them that they were. They were surgeons with excess money. That, that was the... So you need to create it. MVP specification, minimum viable product, was this the least of a product you can get and get some payment from. Very important to focus to have it as narrow as possible. Brand, the first logo, sh should you keep it for 10 years or should you just ditch it every year? It's smart to think about the brand already from day one. And then it's about go-to-market strategies, as I told you. Uh, how to distribute our product, how to create scalability from something that is purely methodics today and create a platform where you create AI efficiency in it. And uh, development of the MVP. So we have connections to a lot of development uh, agencies. So we can actually both do a domain expert that comes in with a very good business ID match them with the developers or a developer that lacks the domain knowledge because he just invented a pretty cool technology. So we can do bridge talks. So, and then we help you with the seed and bridge investment, which is very often the, the second round. Team fulfillment, the team is at the core. Uh, of course, growth, and you know, with it, with the software, for instance, that are going, you are going to place it on the marketplace, it's about price and availability. But when you're selling this software the first time, it's enterprise-grade sales. You, create, you have to create a lot of value on the table to be able to sell it. So that value proposition needs to correlate to what you're delivering. So in the early stage, that has to, you need to have a kick-ass sales person at first. Um, Management, we have a CXO for hires, so you can have a CFO for one hour a week at a reasonable price, so you can do it right the first time. And uh, we've been around since then, 2017 talking to uh, any, everybody, so now we have the matrix of what, what, what is VC ready, what does it mean? We have it down in the matrix, so it's easier for us to understand. So that's what we do in Exploracle, and we are all about cooperation or competition. We don't care, we like you anyway, because you partake this ecosystem, which is in these days vibrant. So let's show that so we, the <coughs> investors that we have on the back room also can see that we can make some good money. Because uh, at the end of the day, that's what they're measured on. So there's three things you need to create the kick-ass kick solution or kick-ass company. That's time, money, and people. So three core ingredients. So we can uh, help you with some of them. And uh, I see you are good people already. So thank you. <laughs>
thanks for having me here. Let's see. All right. My name is uh, Tobias, and I'm head of SuperSDS Scale-Up. I'm going to talk about uh, power coupling, and this is not at all about investment or uh, money. It's all about uh, how can you enable growth through partnerships. First of all, I just want to put you into the context about what is Sopra Stereo and uh, why we launched this uh, scale-up program, which is quite new. It was in the fall of 2018. <coughs> As a large uh, IT consultancy company within uh, Europe, we have a lot of clients within different sectors. And uh, look at here, some of the clients are within these kind of sectors and all of them needs or they wish, what is a new thing that comes, how can you use us or how can you help us. We work as a strategic advisor to these clients and they kind of kick us on the legs and want our help. And the consultants in the business the last 10 or 15 years has been all about you're gonna have all your services or products or anything owned in-house. But in this world, when technology moves so fast and the demands are actually changing so quickly, we kind of found out that we as a consultancy company cannot have all competency in-house. If we still want to provide value to our clients, we have to think a little bit new. So that's why we launched the Scale-Up program last, uh, last fall. And it's all about collaboration. It's all about finding new areas that we could actually collaborate with, new companies, so we can provide more value to our clients. So it's all about finding those startups or scale-ups that have mm -hmm. solutions that are, has come away, has a product market fit, has clients, and are ready to grow. So, um, the program itself, I have the mandate to, uh, to build it from scratch. And uh, in the beginning we have, uh, in, here in Norway, Sweden, UK and Germany. And that means that one of the reasons is that, uh, and we know that the international aspect, both for our clients and the startups, <coughs> with this program we can actually find startups in several different countries to connect to our clients in Norway or Scandinavia, but as well we can find startups in the other from here and to connect them to clients in other countries within the same area. So uh, it's all about to add to the ecosystem how can we together with a startup add more value to the ecosystem and uh, we want to add it not by as I said money but the client proximity. Does it make sense? Yeah. Because it's all about the clients every day has business issues, they have problems, they need help. But they have some, there are some barriers to actually collaborate with startups and scale-ups. Uh, they don't know how to find them, the clients, they don't know how to collaborate. It's a lot of procurement processes. But they are curious. And on the other side, we know there are a lot of startup companies with smart, innovative solutions that most likely has the solution that could solve the client's problem. But they don't have any good uh, arenas to, to connect. So we find out, since we have the clients and work close to them and actually know what they're looking for, we can help them to find the startups to actually solve their problems. So our role here is to be actually the, the bridge builder, or as one said, it's like Tinder for the startups and companies, and startups and clients. So if we can help the clients to find the startups that actually could solve this, the, the, the problems for the client, and we can do the quality assurance, to find out, okay, this is a company which is, has a solution, it has some good uh, references, and we could actually look if this is a fit for the, the client. Then the barrier from the client are so much lower. 
and especially if we could take the role as run the innovation process and be able to, together with the startup, the client and resources from us, be able to actually work together and, and innovate. So it's a quite new concept and it's a quite new way for a consultancy company to work closer to the startup community. So it's all about finding the needs because what we want to do instead of having a kind of traditional accelerator program where you where you have five or ten companies during a limited period, we can change it that we start with the, the, the need from the client and based on that we will find the right set, the right start of scale up that could solve this this issue or this problem. And uh, it's our job to actually do the first or the second screening from this and help the company to find, okay, this startup can solve this and this startup can solve this. And based on the needs of the client, we can actually put together several, one or two different startups and be able to put the solutions into a context that can help the, the client. So it's all about, as uh, Rune told us, it's all about doing, find ideas, define the problems and needs, and actually produce that MVP or pilot of PUC. So we can together show the client that, okay, this is a solution that, yeah, that, uh, that works. And based on that, scale it. So, yeah, you know all about this. And we have this um, innovation methodology that we can do this process in 12 weeks. Because what is important for us is that we can, together with you, show the value for the client as fast as possible. So the client can actually see and validate the solution and then uh, the, uh, be able to scale it. So what do we offer for the, the startups that we take into the, the program? Well. We have the connection to the, the, the clients, both in Scandinavia and the rest of Europe. And we also have like, in Norway we have 2,000 uh, 2, people working here and then the, in the whole company it's like 45,000. So we have kind of 45,000 problem solvers that can actually help you to, to find how we can uh, to help the companies in the, in the program. And except all the, like, the technology stuff, it's much more about also how to build a company, how to build a startup, how to make the startup ready for growth. And uh, it's all about like how to recruit, how to go to market, as well as find other, uh, if we need like money, we can um, connect to these uh, venture capital uh, actors <coughs> and be able to, to uh, introduce you to other people in our, our network. So basically it's all about find the clients that has needs as well as find the startups that can actually solve this. So it's all about that and that's one way to enable growth with the help of client proximity and get those clients and show them and have the good, the good references to be able to grow. Grow further on. Yes. If this sounds interesting, please uh, check at uh, our web page and uh, also be able to please connect with me. I would uh, like to talk to you and hear more about it because in the phase we are now, we're looking for this, the, the startups and scale ups that has solutions that we can most likely see if there are some fit with our clients. So finally, I would like to end with this. Think big, and start small, and scale up. Thank you. Thank you, Tobias. Uh, with those words, I invite you. We invite you to uh, Estonia to meet the uh, startups in Estonia. Maybe among the best in Europe, with a lot of activities. So uh, you're welcome. Uh, next on stage is uh, Crowdworks. Thank okay.
So, uh, thank you so much for inviting us. Uh, my name is uh, Adam. I'm a uh, founder of uh, Godworks. Um, this is uh, Stefan. Hi. He's a code owner and he's also a platform engineer. So, what we're going to talk about mm -hmm. is uh, to uh, present uh, and talk about uh, what is Godworks and also to give uh, some, uh, some insights into um, how we view uh, the importance of cybersecurity related to what, what we're doing, basically. So, uh, Crowdworks is uh, a platform for companies and for investors. And it's about creating uh, transparency into the investments. Uh, for us, it's to give the companies a tool where they can create a vibrant community on top of their cap table. And for the investors to be able to actually join the journey when they have invested, uh, to be kept along, updated on the key achievements, on whatever the company is doing, to see actually how their money is uh, spent. So, yeah, <laughs> it's time to start uh, investing in your investors, and we think that, uh, uh, or we see that for, for startups, of course, investors are key, and it's uh, very important uh, uh, to. Um, to have them on board, um, both for, of course, the funding, which is key for any ambitious startup, but also for all the other things that an investor can bring, both, of course, from angel investors that are very dedicated into actually providing more than just capital, and accelerators, but also in the long term for uh, private investors joining the company, uh, wanting to actually contribute. So we did uh, a survey um, previous uh, this year where we saw that, yes, we, we are right, it's important uh, with communication uh, for investors. And they want, to be, um, they want to be included. Transparency is key for them to actually invest. But what we also saw, they saw that, uh, the other side is that it's not functioning uh, good enough today. Um, eight out of ten investors feel that they don't get enough uh, communication information about what's going on in the company. And they want to be included, they want to contribute, they want to see some progress on uh, key strategy, uh, uh, key figures, and uh, they want to actually take part in this journey. And we acknowledge and we know that funding takes time, we think it takes too much time. And uh, what is uh, Everybody is saying is that fundraising should be a continuous cycle, but we see that it usually takes, we see in some figures, it takes six to nine months to get investors on board, to do the capital raise, and then you can focus on your business again, uh, maybe for 12 months, and then you have to do the capital raise again. And then obviously in these peaks, uh, which is uh, three quarters of the time, uh, basically uh, up to that, you have to spend a lot of your energy doing something else than uh, developing your business. Meaning that uh, your business value uh, will, of course, increase when you have time, but in the fundraising cycles, it will be um, reduced traction for the company, which is not good. So we think that fundraising should be continuous, and that's also what Crowdworks um, helps the companies uh, do. Make this a continuous process where you actually do your business, but at the same time you build trust towards prospective investors, you make them follow your company for a while, then they can invest, and of course you engage your existing investors, but you also attract new investors uh, along the way. So this could be something that doesn't take your focus away from actually creating a business value. And uh, investors is good, but engaged investors are even better. So, uh, so many things that an investor can bring, uh, also after um, the program, activation program, or after kind of the structured process is, uh, is over, then and also all the private investors out there have a lot to offer. They have networks, they have knowledge, and they want to contribute. We've seen that 60% want to spend actually more than 15 minutes a week if they are given the opportunity to actually help the company that they have invested in. So they should be uh, given the chance, uh, is what we think. So Crowdworks is um, about creating a, a vibrant community on top of the company's cap table to involve 
the key players to involve the advisors, the investors, and be able to uh, continue contributing also after the funding is done for the investors, and also after the company goes out of, for example, an accelerator, or, um, and also for an accelerator to keep uh, contact with all these companies to build their own communities is something that we also see a great uh, need for, so that each company can keep their investors up to date, but also the companies keep their advisors and mentors up to date. So that's basically what CrowdWorks is. And, and then there's so much information that's here, so obviously uh, security uh, is very important for us. Uh, all that uh, we will be, we also basically they are the gatekeepers of uh, information. Uh, so, um, yeah, cybersecurity is very important. Yeah, uh, so obviously our main focus at CrowdWorks is developing features and giving value to our customers. But at the same time we need to focus on the security of our platform and ensure that the customers trust us to uh, maintain the data they put in. So, as you all know, security is really hard, uh, and so we avoid developing our own security system, and we use tried and uh, trusted uh, solutions that help uh, us keep uh, the data secure. Uh, we, uh, we host a platform, uh, a Google Cloud platform. We use uh, identity service such as Auth0 for identity management, and we keep our external dependencies up to date with uh, the latest security patches. However, even though uh, a software is secure, um, there's a principle in software security that uh, the security is only as strong as the weakest link, and that's often the humans in the, uh, in the equation. So uh, we have a focus on educating uh, everybody uh, on how to stay secure from the CEO down to the salespersons, uh, or from uh, using strong and uh, unique passwords to uh, using two-factor authentication uh, and avoiding downloading uh, attachments from emails. Uh, but that's, as a human, uh, staying secure all the time is hard, so we're excited that there are uh, so many startups that uh, focus on making security easier. So uh, thank you for your attention, and uh, please come talk to us afterwards. Thank you very much. Uh, now we are heading for the important stuff today from Estonia. Uh, we will have started wise guys on the scene, and they will present their uh, accelerator uh, sub north. And uh, after that, we also will have pitches from uh, members in the accelerator. So welcome, Farid. Thank you. Like all good things, I hope this works when we actually need it to. Firstly, thank you very much for the warm welcome and for having us here today. Uh, I think it's, um, it's fantastic to meet so many different uh, parts of the ecosystem here in, uh, in Norway. Uh, before I start, I'm going to do a quick, uh, it's technically a three minute presentation that I did in, in, in Stockholm, but I, I, I'm going to spend about five minutes on it. But before I start, uh, I need to tell something that's quite personal to me. Uh, I actually work with Startup Wise Guys, I've been working with them for the last two years, uh, and um, I'm technically um, a consultant, and I work with them, I don't have to be here, I have my own consulting practice, but I work with Startup Wise Guys 
um, out of this, I don't know, un unknown need for creating impact. It's something that I cannot put in words. But I like to tell people that uh, one of the reasons why I'm here is because I see so much that can be done by over the last two and a half years I've worked with 70 plus startups that in my 12 years of my corporate life I don't think I would have ever managed to have that kind of impact. Um, so I, I'm, I'm firstly, you know, I'm really proud that I can do this and I'm super lucky that I can do it as well. And so I have some of my startups here uh, who are going to talk a little bit about it. Uh, but my name is Farid, I'm the Managing Director of Cyber North. Uh, Cyber North is Startup Wise Guys, Cybersecurity, Defense and Artificial Intelligence startup accelerator um, up in Tallinn. But I want to start about why we all do this, and this is a common across Startup Wise Guys. We are super passionate about helping founders become entrepreneurs and help them build great international tech companies. And this is the, this is the key for everything we do, right? And the third part over here, which is not here, is which I've realized over the last two years, is for whatever reason, they come out as better people. They come out as better founders. They come out with people who not only think about money, but think about the purpose of their customers, the purpose of their product, and why they're doing stuff. And I think that's really important because that drives our long-term vision. Um, and how do we do this? We do this by, by providing early stage startups. So we're an early start um, stage um, accelerator. We, so we support them through coaching, through mentorship, and funding. And the accelerator is a perfect kind of, um, let's say, vehicle to do that. Uh, we, we, we invest uh, in our program, uh, we get mentors, um, and at the end, hopefully, uh, our startups have some impact. Uh, we've been going for more than seven years. Uh, we have over 15 programs that we've run. We have over 145 portfolio companies, uh, and they've raised over 27 million. This makes us one of the most experienced startup accelerator in Europe. Um, and the interesting part is, and the thing that I'm really proud of, and the thing that I love to ask when I go back to Spain, because I live in Spain, is uh, when they say, oh, we have this accelerator as well, I like to ask them about the survival rate. So the survival rate for us is a, is a really important figure because it measures how many of our startups are actually increasing their revenue. Um, and because we're early stage, you know, surviving, they're alive, they're not dead, 18 months after they leave the program. Um, and I think it's a really interesting way of measuring how effective um, everything you do is. Um, and, se and this is 77%. Uh, the industry average is less than 10%. So less than 1 out of 10 ideas makes it to a startup, less than 1 out of 10 startups makes it uh, survives for more than 18 months. So we're very proud of this number and um, I mean, Agita here has been working with Sarvai Lessons since the start, so she can answer some of the questions as to why this is the case. I have my own, uh, my own reasons as to why this, is, uh, why this works. Um, and it's usually down to the founders, to the teams. Um, so we, we have um, a huge number of verticals. We, we focus on B2B SaaS, we focus on FinTech, we focus on cybersecurity. And in B2B SaaS, we've gone everything from enterprise software, VR, AR, robotics, industry 4.0, prop tech, e-commerce infrastructure. The reason you see 125 companies over there is because we normally measure the activeness only 18 months after they've left the program. So in the last, I think, 12 months, we've had about 35 to 40 companies which will get added to the list. Um, but the really cool thing that I'd like to always show people is that our, our startups employ over 700 people. And I think that's amazing that, you, you, you know, in so much time, you can have so much of impact. And 700 employees, 700 families. Um, we also have our FinTech programs, uh, which we ran with, uh, in cooperation with Swedbank. So we also do a lot of corporate innovation and corporate partnerships. Um, I used to work with Telefonica, I had a startup in Telefonica, my annual, rev, uh, my annual budget was 1.6 billion euros for a team of 26. I can run many programs with hedge bets across 30 companies if I wanted to with that kind of a budget. So now I tell a lot of co companies like, hey, uh, you guys have tried this on your own. 92% of corporate accelerators have failed and shut down. Go to people who've been doing this and know how to do it, right? So we're really proud that we can, we can start doing this and we've already started doing this in the FinTech space. Um, and this is what they were when they started. I'm not here because I was uh, still trying to sell Wi-Fi in America. Um, um, and there were three people when they started, wise guys. Um, this is us now. We're across the, all the Baltics. Um, 
We also do programs across Denmark. Uh, we've been doing programs for the Georgian government and, you know, very where they need a lot of help uh, in trying to understand why and how to make something stick and successful. Uh, this is the team now. Um, and I think one of the things that you, I mentioned, why do I think this is so successful and why are we so... Have, because uh, we have a very international team. We have a team um, from Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Denmark, India, Britain, uh, Spain. Uh, and I think that adds a lot of networks. Uh, nobody from Norway yet, so we're hoping, you know, so. soon, soon. Uh, but it's, it's, a, it's a bunch of people who are, who are really passionate about what they do. They do it for the same reasons I do my, uh, I come to work. Um, and this is something I just added recently. This is not me uh, editing it. This is exactly how it was printed in LinkedIn. But in the last week, we were actually, uh, um, there was a startup heat map report that came out of the five uh, most international startup accelerators in all of Europe. And Startup Wise Guys is, is number three. Um, even though they only took into account we have 69 startups, even though we have 145, right? Uh, and here we're competing with you know, Virgin Media, Startup Bootcamp, High Tech, Tech Stars London, not to mention my previous employer, Telefonica, which um, has 12 startup accelerators called Wiras. And they are the, the, the bottom five least international accelerators in the world, according to that report. I really urge you to go. It's a really good, it's a really good read because they checked out 71 accelerators across 18 countries. So this internationalism, I mean, you guys know this, you know why, why Scandinavia is such a, such a hub for startups as well. It's purely because of the internationalism of you know, what you guys attract over here. And I think the same thing is for Startup Wise Guys as well. Uh, what do we focus on? This is the other reason why I think we're so successful. At least since I've been here, this is what I focus on, the team. We're an early stage program. Uh, we know that the team is essential, the team of the startups, the founders. Because we know that product can be made, you can hire people, you can make a product, you can pivot, market can be found, but the team cannot be constructed. It's not like a boy band that you can put people in a room together and they, and they magically start working. Um, even though I would love to see that. Um, but I think this is something that's really important. That, I, I mean, I'm a completely unbiased, even though I work with Sarah White guys, for me, coming from corporate, this has been like one of the biggest learnings that I've, I've had is to focus on the team. So we have a really, uh, we have a three-month program. Where we focus mainly on B2B, um, SaaS as a, as a, as a market. Um, and the one thing people say is we are no bullshit. Some of the startups here will tell you, they've been told that they've been shit quite a few times. Pardon my French. They've been told they've been, they've been quite bad at whatever they've been doing for some time. Their product lacks uh, focus. Their pitching lacks focus. Um, and it's, it's a matter of, uh, of that tough love to get them to that level, right? Uh, and I think I'm probably the softest of the group, but uh, the core team is, uh, is pretty harsh. Uh, let's put it that way. And that works. And this is what they get out of the program. Three months later, they have new team members. Uh, they have some source of fan funding and some sales traction. On average, seven out of ten of our startups raise a round of 100 plus K within six months of leaving the program. That's usually a, a pre-seed round, so to speak, to get them, keep them going till they, till their main round. Our uh, program is normally uh, quite flexible, but this is the basic conditions. We give them cash and program uh, for up to 9%, and then we can also follow up um, for about 250K um, afterwards. But we never follow on our own. We always co-invest. Uh, and this, to me, is a really good thing because in Barcelona, there's a lot of free money. In Barcelona, you can write a product, a business plan, and you can get 100k, no strings attached. But then you never get follow-on because nobody has is there to vouch for you because you just burn through 100k in 10 months with nothing to show. So I think this is a really important thing that we can actually follow through some of our invest uh, invested startups um, with our own money, with our investment. Um, I'd like to show this slide because. This is something that I learned is that you will never walk alone. Uh, we do an event every year in Spain. It's called the Startup Wise Guys Getaway. All 145 startups are invited. Investors actually pay money to come and see them. Um, and we basically um, form this alumni network, which is super uh, helpful and very strong. 
Um, and uh, not only do we have digital mediums like Facebook and, and WhatsApp groups to communicate, but we actually have this face-to-face -face event where everybody from the Startup Wise Guys teams, the startups, they all come for, for a three-day event. Um, they raise money, they find clients, they meet investors, they figure out where they want to go next, they want to scale up, they want to go to the US, and then they form their, you know, let's say, their one-year plan of what, what am I going to do to the next getaway. And I think it's a, it's a very, we're probably the only accelerator that does that, uh, but we always, you know, focus on you, you will never walk alone. And um, in the two and a half years we've been there, I started off when they were just an accelerator doing B2B SaaS and FinTech. And now we've kind of scaled new, new horizons. We launched Cyber North this year. It's actually in association with the Ministry of Defense of Estonia and the Estonian Defense Industrial Association. Um, and it's the first regular cybersecurity accelerator in mainland Europe. Cylon being the other one, which is not technically mainland, it's an island in the UK, soon to be Brexited out. Um, so. <laughs> I'm British. I'm British living in Barcelona, so I have the Catalan and the, the UK problem, personally. Um, um, but yes, we started off this with an idea. It was purely an idea. We saw that there were 225,000 startups in cybersecurity, but um, literally only Cylon in, the U in, in all of Europe that was feeding them. Uh, and the US and Australia had a couple more, but that was it. So there was this un unserved need and um, and we started it. I mean, this is what I like about Wise Guys. You can actually bring new ideas to life. Um, we started in March. We're currently in week eight. So you, you still see the startups five weeks before graduation. So give them some creative uh, leeway. Um, and we, along with this, we also started working with a lot of corporates. So we actually now do a lot of corporate innovation programs. We are working on hackathons. We, like you mentioned with Garage 48, we did the tax hackathon with the government of Latvia for uh, using blockchain initiatives. We had, I think, 40 odd teams. So we're actually now, um, you know, going right from the early stage accelerator program to, um, you know, coming up with ideas, doing hackathons, working on working with par partnerships and collaborations. And I think that's really, that's really important because somebody said that don't compete, collaborate, that's exactly what we're hoping to do. Uh, if I had three things to remember, we're very experienced, we're very international. We have a 77% survival rate, our intense zero bullshit acceleration works for both standalone startup uh, accelerators and corporate programs. And we think of startups long term. You can apply at startupwiseguys.com for our next programs. We have two more programs coming up in the fall. We'll tell you a little bit more about that. Mm -hmm. But I have a little bonus for you guys. If you scan this little QR code, we actually have a, a Baltic and um, Startup Scene Report 2017-2018. It's still very current because it was the um, end of 2018 that was published. Uh, it gives you all the details of what's happening in the Baltics, um, you know, right from how do you find programmers, what do you pay them versus uh, the Nordics, the rest of Europe, and, uh, and, Western, and Western Europe. So that's pretty much it from me, I think, yes. Do you have any questions? I'm happy to answer any questions in real time. Um, while uh, technology uh, experts figure out how do we proceed next. This one. Any questions? Anything about uh, Cyber North? Um, so I start with wise guys. What are, what are you doing for you? Which where are you from? Where do you belong? I'm Indian. And I've lived in six countries. I have a British passport, but I live in Tallinn and in Barcelona. But that answers anyone's questions. Anybody is wondering, what the hell? Who are you? Your accent is not Estonian, but you're not Indian, and I don't know where you're from. Uh, just so you know, uh, that's where I. Yeah. I have a question. It's yes. a stupid one. Sorry. Go for it. No, that's also a question. Though. Now, these Estonians in the room, you know, you close your eyes. They are really bragging that Estonia is really, really a shit when it comes to cyber security and stuff. Mm -hmm. Now, you come from the UK or somewhere else, yeah. and into Estonia, yeah. doing that sort of stuff. Is it true? So, firstly, it's not a stupid question because it's the same question everybody asks me. I was at Latitude 59 on Thursday doing another talk, and that's the same question they asked me, like, hey, why are you here? Why do you come to Estonia? 
Um, I have two answers for that. So firstly, regarding cybersecurity. Um, I think with cybersecurity, you find that most of the really cool stuff is not actually happening on in the mainstream, right? Uh, so I wouldn't I wouldn't say that Estonia is really amazing at cybersecurity, but they have the right priorities there. They're doing everything possible because you have to understand that even because I scouted for Cyber North, and you can't. It's a very different kind of scouting, right? Most of the products are sitting in universities. So I call it the, the, the Asia problem converting technology to product, product to company. They all sit in technology, little technology silos. It's very difficult to move them. So from a, from a technology point of view, Estonia has an amazing ecosystem. From a support point of view, they have an amazing ecosystem because uh, everything is digital. So everything that they do, uh, they have like a, you know, a sandbox set already that they can test it on. So from a cybersecurity point of view, I think the priorities that they put in 2008, well actually they put it in 2012 or something like that, a little bit later, is kind of bearing fruit now. You know, they have, I think had a 40 or 50 percent increase year on year on cybersecurity startups. Now the second question is what, not, what am I doing from Europe over here? Uh, I, I have this, um, it's a personal thing that I've noticed that in, in Estonia and the Baltic, so I, I actually am fond of Latvia as well. Um, and what I find is that the, the, the startup ecosystem is very, very conducive to helping each other. It's something that's quite rare that all the unicorns are actively going and man mentoring and helping startups without this whole concept of what's in it for me. Right? Whereas when I go to like Barcelona or when I go to London, it's always a time game. Where am I, where where I going to get the most out of for me? And this is, it might sound like a generalization, but for me, it found, I found it much easier to give back and have impact in, in this ecosystem, uh, personally. And, and also, I, I go back to Spain for the summer, so it's, the beach is still there. Uh, but if I had to say something, I would say that I found that the Baltics are the best kept secret in Europe. And the Baltics, people from Baltics hate it when I say that because then they're like, you're giving it away. Um, but yeah, that's what I would, I would say why I'm there from a cybersecurity point of view. Um, I don't mean to ask because I doubt it, but it's very interesting to hear your perspective on it because you have the time. Yeah. I mean, I, I often tell people I have nothing to gain from being here. Like, I, 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 I do it because I just find that there's something that brings me back. I don't know what it is. I can't put my finger on it. Uh, I haven't found it um, in India. I haven't found it in Australia because I've tried to move. Uh, I was in Singapore as well. I lived in Singapore. I can't find it. But just this ability of people to help. Like you call up somebody from TransferWise or from Pipedrive and they're like, yeah, sure, I'll come and mentor. You're like, why? Why would you mentor? For nothing. Like nobody asks you like, oh, how much are you going to pay? And so for me, that is, I don't know what it is. I don't know, it's maybe they haven't caught on to this like getting money for stuff to get, I don't know. But yes. Uh, but sure, I'm happy to talk to you more about this later on as well. Okay. So I'm going to own now the... Um, wasn't me. It was not me. It was just literally. <laughs> I was just picking this up. Sorry. Yes. So uh, I'm going to introduce our our startups. Um, we have seven of them. They are all going to do a three minute pitch. Um, so you know, stay for that. Uh, you can ask them questions later on during the sushi time. Uh, oh, sorry, snack. Did I have the sushi? Uh, <laughs> I just had that in my head. Um, but I'll, I'll tell you something. So we talked about um, how do startups, how do we find startups? What was Cybernaut? So Cybernaut was a very difficult um, program to scout for. Uh, I've done scouting for now seven programs, uh, and scouting and editing and like. Um, and what we actually did an event in Turkey. We like to go to Turkey and a lot of the outlier countries, um, a lot outside of the EU, because the VCs love us there. They love us to come there. Because uh, they have startups that are just not purely because of the closed ecosystem are not cutting it, are not you know the MRRs aren't rising after a level they plateau, and then they want us to take them to Estonia, make them Estonian, get them into Europe, and then they become so so much more investable in, in Turkey. So we actually do this, and this is how I met. I actually met uh, Pinar and Sergan from our first uh, cybersecurity startup, which was from Batch Nine, which was five batches ago. And he said, hey, you've got to meet these guys, they're, they're very cool. I don't know what they're doing, but they sound like they're, they're, they're onto something cool. So that's how we met, we had uh, breakfast, and the next thing I know, uh, Pinar is here in Estonia, she's actually moving her entire company 
from, from Turkey, so I'd love for you to welcome Pinar with Automate. And uh, yes. yeah. the, the bottom one, all the startups, <laughs> all the startups, all the startups. The bottom button is to move forward, the top button is to move back. Now I don't have to repeat it, but you welcome um, Automate. <laughs> My name is Pinar, I'm the co-founder and CEO of Automate. We all remember Titanic, the British liner which sank in North Atlantic. She was built to be the biggest man-made project on the planet. The shipping company which built Titanic has spent seven and a half million dollars to finish it. And they lost everything in less than three hours crashing into an iceberg. While they were sailing in full speed, they were depending on one guy, Frederick, who was a lookout, sailor and survivor of Titanic. His job was to look out the icebergs in the ocean. He had no binoculars and he had to wait 30 seconds before warning the captain to avoid false positives. Lack of tools and false positives were the problems then in 1912. And they are, they, are, they are the same problems that our industry is facing today. The code analyzers in the market are usually too slow and it is too late when they report and they are creating too many false positives. <coughs> Automate solve these issues. We empower developers and managers to find security vulnerabilities super fast with 99% accuracy using a security model which is trained by machine learning. Natural language processing lies at the heart of our product. Our unique engine can find the exact vulnerabilities in seconds compared to hours and even days with the existing products in the market. And those products, they are depending on technologies which were developed during 50s and 60s just after World War II. We got into this because we are a part of this market for the past seven years. 51 million US dollars, 51 billion US dollars is spent in application security markets and it's growing by 14% per year. We have plenty of room to grow. We are a great team. We have been friends for more than 10 years. We know the competitive landscape. We tried every product in the market. Nothing has to solve these issues. Up to now, we have analyzed more than a billion lines of code in three different geographies covering 37 enterprise customers. And we have a growing revenue. This year, we already hit last year's revenue numbers. Now you know what we are building and why we are building it. We are looking for 750k euros to go fast. We will further develop the product, we will scale the team, and we will get our first enterprise customers in the market. We have a team, there is a pain, and we have the solution. If you are willing to be a part of this revolution, come and meet us after the pitch. And again, my name is Pinar, I'm from, from Automate. Thank you. One thing that I, I've, I don't know if people caught on to, this, but this, basically they're taking technology that's reducing time to analyze codes, which is now currently taking five days to do it in less than minutes. I let this sink into my brain and I sometimes think, is this a 100x improvement? Thousand, I mean, is there a math I can do to see how many x improvement is this? And it's crazy what, uh, what, what you can do. And when I met them, um, they just had an idea, like they've been, they've been working in this industry for the last 10, 14 years. They're, uh, I, won't, I won't tell them what their business is, but basically they know this market. Um, so it's fascinating for me to actually now see their product actually working um, in, the, in the short span that I've known them. So, you know, it's, uh, it's great to see the, the movement there. Um, our next team, again, um, you sometimes meet these founders and you kind of go like, I, I want to be more like him. I want to be more like him. I don't know where, how we found him. Uh, again, he was a contact through our first um, cybersecurity um, startup called TrapMind. 
And he said, hey, you got to meet this guy. He's really good. Uh, and he's really well known in Turkey. And I said, okay, let's, let's, let's meet him. Um, and these guys are, are, in my opinion, changing some of the, the ways that people look at technical cybersecurity training. And I say that because uh, I know how many certifications are out there. But you need to really experience what these guys do to understand uh, why it's special. So I'm going to now call on stage Kubi. Uh, he's the CEO of Thank you. It's nice to be here. Actually, before we, I start, I need to inform you that some people call me crazy. So if I make strange things, feel free to laugh. <laughs> No problem. Uh, the bottom no. <coughs> okay, my story goes back to 2012. Uh, while I was working as a cyber security expert in one of the biggest brands in the world, a famous hacker group declared war on us. Uh, I was excited uh, when, when I first hear that, but however, uh, during the 50 days of conflict, my colleague ended up in hospital because of stress, intense pressure, and emotional paralysis. In fact, 90% of cybersecurity experts define those gaps as their primary enemy, in addition of technical ones. So clearly, we need much more effective approach to deal with this never-ending struggle. Like special forces, they are not only trained for technical skills, but also trained for soft skills like leadership, mental resilience, teaming, and many other crucial abilities. My name is Kubi. I'm founder of Cyber Struggle. We set up Cyber Struggle to reinvent cybersecurity trainings and industry certifications. While others are still focusing on only offensive or defensive technical skills, we combine those skills with different disciplines like criminology, psychological warfare, and terrorism studies. We also put soft skills and agile methodologies in the heart of our trainings to provide 360 degree security vision and skill set. Our customers are individuals who want to make a great difference in their cybersecurity career, and the corporates who are keen to have special forces in their teams. Currently, we have 15K MRR with 98% of customer satisfaction. We have validated our trainings in Turkish and Malaysian markets. In fact, Big Four put our certifications in their job description as a major plus. We have a great team, including uh, technical experts, hackers, retired special forces, and investigative psychologists. We are backed by amazing startup wise guys and ready for global domination. <laughs> so, uh, currently, we are looking for investment and also <coughs> partnership opportunities to go faster. Once again, I'm Kubi, founder of Cyber Struggle. We train and certify the special forces of cyber world. If you are interested in, let's talk. All right, Kubi, fresh off two flights and delivered like a like an ace. So you know, I, I'm really passionate about customer focus and customer centricity, right? And it fascinates me that there are 90 percent of cybersecurity experts said that the technical skills weren't enough. 90% yet, Microsoft, Cisco, you can go online and get a certification. I can get an online certification in a month. And it's not important. It's not what's going to keep me alive. I find this completely fascinating in today's world. And that's why, you know, I love what he's doing. And you should talk to him more about his product because his product has so many layers in it that it makes, to me, it makes it this completely, you know, uh, circular piece that is reinventing itself every time, you know, a program happens. So, um, and again, he's now Estonian, yeah. from all the way from Turkey, but Estonian, uh, and he's had, he's had a fascinating life as well. Um, so, thanks a lot, Chloe. Our next team, again, comes from far lands, uh, from, uh, 
from, they're, they're Estonian, but they're originally from Kazakhstan. Um, and again, we met them at one of the most obscure events, and they were like, oh, we already know we're doing this. And they said, oh yeah, there's, but there's so many markets, there's so many of these products in the market. Like, it's not, I, I don't know about this. And then we met the founders, and we, we saw the team. And then we saw, okay, well, there's something quite unique in what the product does. Uh, and, I, and I'll tell you a little bit more about it after the pitch, but anyway, I want to I welcome Zandos to the stage from, uh, from Black Coder. Thank you very much. <coughs> and down button is to move forward. Okay. okay. Thank you. Uh, glad to meet you today. Uh, okay. When I was 15, my father came to me to talk about girls. But at that time, I looked like this guy. But of course he was talking about protection. But I wasn't into girls, I was more into hacking. So when I uh, hacked my first website, I realized that nobody cares about website protection unless something bad happens. And it has been 17 years, the situation hasn't changed. Every day hackers attack more than 30,000 websites around the world. On the internet, we see these uh, website infections as we have seen sex epidemics in the 80s. <clears throat> Nobody uses basic protection. And that is the main reason why many of us get uh, phishing emails, spam, download viruses from infected websites, and see inappropriate ads. There have been various paid solutions uh, for 10 uh, years on the market, like uh, Sukuri, Sitelock, Cloudflare, but uh, less than 3% of the websites in the world use paid security service. Nobody willing to pay uh, for the safety of their website. From the beginning, we have been focused on covering and protecting the whole internet and uh, uh, building a highly uh, scalable and cost-efficient uh, infrastructure. Uh, we are currently monitoring 150,000 of websites and obtaining all information uh, about cyber attacks uh, for one of our biggest clients. And because we designed our product with our future vision in mind, uh, every incremental website costs us to protect, costs us less than a cent per month. And do you know how much we're going to charge for that for our customers? Mm -hmm. Nothing. We removed barrier for 97% of websites. Um, it is completely free for every individual website owners. Our goal is to um, become a standard in the field of website security and our mission is to prevent this global epidemic of website infections <coughs> and provide every website owner with basic security rights. We make money by uh, providing, uh, charging our clients by providing the first line of support and by providing um, WebSock security services for our enterprise, enterprise clients and third uh, by collecting footprints and traces of cyber attacks and selling this data to national certs, um, financial structures, and hosting providers because they're interested in improving their security as well. Our current MRR is uh, around 10K and we have clients in B2B and B2G sectors. We have already started integrating with hosting providers We are a group of um, practical ethical hackers, um, passionate about cybersecurity. Uh, we've been uh, winning uh, competition, hacking competitions around the world for the past two years. And we'll be raising 750,000 euros in three months for scaling and product ecosystem development. And my name is Jean Dos. I'm a founder of WebTotem. Come fi find me and let's have a chat. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Zando. So, um, 
on the face of it, it sounds like a very like a normal product, right? You might think like, oh, it's just another website for me. But I, I have a few websites. I have three websites. And I used to always think, what, what would I do if they got hacked? Who would I call? Who would I call and who would I trust? Do I have a backup version of it? And, and I realized that these are the questions that are currently plaguing... You might not know it. You might not know it until something goes wrong, right? You might not know that, oh, I should have paid that 69 euros for my Google backup uh, after you use your lap uh, lose your laptop or it gets stolen in Madrid. But, which has happened, by the way. Uh, <laughs> but so to, to me, this is what I saw. I, I like the idea of, uh, you know, and we've been speaking about this new business model about how uh, that four euro 99 a month doesn't actually compare to what you can do when you have a million websites under under you know monitoring, um, and and the scalability of that product to me seems uh, uh, pretty efficient as well. So um, and I asked him, I said, hey, but what what if you guys are doing something dodgy? Like what if you guys have something? And he said, our code is available. You can have a look at it. You can audit it. You can look at exactly what we have. So um, so I'm really excited about this because firstly it's, it's meant for non-technical people, and secondly it's meant to be super easy. Uh, you can take your website to there, you can go to the website, put your website's address in there, and start protecting it completely free. And you get a, you get a report, color, you know, red, yellow, green color report on your phone that tells you what is good and what is not. And I'm like, oh. that's how you make, uh, make things uh, easy for people like me, not technical people. Um, all right, the next team, this is one of the teams that I, I can't put words to describe like what uh, what we were thinking. From, a, from an investor point of view, I, I told Startup Wise, I said this is complete, uh, this is not something that uh, we normally go for. Um, but I think considering that five elections have been won and lost without one computer being hacked, uh, this particular product is super relevant for, for today's world. So I want to bring on stage Dimitri from Fakes Killer. Uh, first of all, thank you for having me here. I'm happy to be here and to be an Estonian. And I love uh, Estonia and I love it because of Startup Wise guys. And my Ukrainian friends, they still can't excuse me. Uh, in the last football uh, game, I was cheering game between Estonia and Ukraine. It was a hockey game. I was cheering for Estonia. <laughs> and uh, this is because uh, these are great people and Estonia is great environment. So, uh, what we are doing now in uh, Estonia and startup wise and now uh, growing the uh, worldwide. Uh, myself, I'm a freelance journalist. So, several years ago, I was asked to uh, write another article. I was asked by a Canadian magazine. <coughs> and uh, you know that it was already at that point in 2014 impossible to write anything about Ukraine without writing about the Russian war about, uh, against my country. So I went to uh, this city. It was already occupied by uh, Russian terrorists for fact-checking uh, because uh, that was impossible to check facts just sitting online and watching TVs. And, uh, I spent there longer than I expected to stay there. I spent there 48 days because uh, I was detained by the terrorists and put in a basement. Uh, this basement is much better, so I'm enjoying mm -hmm. uh, it from all the animals. <coughs> and uh, in that basement, I felt myself uh, quite uh, hopeless because uh, you know, I talked to other people in the basement, I talked to terrorists uh, because they uh, interrogated me, you know, accusing of being CIA spy, uh, Ukrainian spy, etc., etc. So lots of crazy uh, and funny things. But I, I, I kind of tried to tell them that no, the, what, what they know about Ukraine and the world, uh, this is mostly crap. They, 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 they were just indoctrinated. And uh, I had enough time in the basement, like, as I mentioned, 48 days. This is former factory in the center of the city. And there was no internet uh, in the basement, uh, problem with connection, you know. 
but I had enough time to uh, irritate what what I am doing now. So, uh, yeah, I feel like this monkey. And this guy, by the way, he's, uh, he was one of those who interrogated me. And uh, so, because I was very uncomfortable prisoner, I, I, I'm not a Nazi, because they think that we Ukrainians all of our Nazis, and, and we are killing uh, everyone who is speaking Russian. So that's basically the reason. And that's why they came from Russia to save us uh, from, from, from ourselves. So lots of crap, basically because of propaganda, because of disinformation, because of fake news. So when, I, when they got rid of me, because I was very uncomfortable, like I, I'm not Nazi, I have Russian surname, I'm of Jewish origin, I'm a, and, and I managed to inform my friends where I was kept, so they tried to, read, to get rid of me, and, and not through killing me, but just to get him, let him go. So I have found that actually there are hundreds of fact-checking organizations worldwide doing great job of fact-checking. So problem is still that there are online, there on Facebook, you know, there are some other fakes like Flat Earth Society fakes. And then a great discussion now, one of the biggest discussion now is the discussion between Donatus thinkers and, and flat earth thinkers. And, uh, well, Russian propaganda which makes such people like those coming to my country and killing people. More than 10,000 people are killed as of now. And not only because of Russian propaganda, but because of all stupids and racist and Nazis and here, uh, lots of people are suffering. So what can be done about this? Given that there is fact checking, and there are still lots of uh, fakes on, online, on, on, on social platforms. Basically, we need to bring that fact checking experience and content to our browsing experience. And that's what we are doing. We are neutralizing every fake news by link to quality data and wider context. So we take content from uh, <coughs> professional fact checkers. We let people detect fakes, and then we let them inform their friends about those fakes. Because uh, we, we cannot uh, fight against fakes uh, ourselves. The fight against disinformation is social. So it's about basically involving our friends into that fight. Because otherwise all that content from fact checkers will stay, stay on their websites. That's it. And that's how we are doing that. Uh, now, when you are browsing it uh, on, on your social platforms, you will see the context. And if a fake or just incorrect information is detected, then you will see the context with the link to the background story on that fake. So it's not just telling you, okay, this is probably fake because of this and this word. No, we are giving the real story behind this fake. So when you are sending this to your friend who had happened to share this fake, you can actually give that link to the real story and, and give the real data saying, look, this is not just my opinion that you have published the crap. No, this is independent, like checking quality data, and go there and check if you don't believe me. And yeah, that's how you send that uh, to, to your friend. Uh, we tested our technology, we got uh, 1,020 installations less than two weeks. And moreover, we found out that the source, the, the websites posting incorrect data, they started correcting the data. I did not expect this to happen so fast. So the impact of this can be even bigger than we expected. We expected just you know, users to install it and probably yeah, send those links to their friends. No, it's uh, changing the, the, the media context. Uh, I think that there are at least two markets. Uh, we have already paying clients in this market because electoral fakes, uh, they, uh, you know, you understand what is electoral fakes. There are already a number of elections, not only in the United States, impacted by attempts to meddle into the local uh, elections by uh, some our neighboring states. 
So, and reputation protection. Actually, again, I did not expect this market to uh, pop up, but actually we now ask by several uh, corporates under smear campaigns to help them protect their reputation. And this is a market of uh, uh, PR companies. Now PR companies are serving those corporates under smear campaigns. And the legal market. This is defamation market. These are millions of dollars. <coughs> This is our, uh, no, it's a fake, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> this is our team. Uh, I'm proud, uh, I have this team. Uh, actually, I managed to uh, hire uh, two of the mentors of Startup Wise Guys. And I think this is the reason of the high survival rate. Uh, probably, it's not a secret, I hope. That. But uh, actually, they think that if you are fucking up your startup, then they uh, need to help also with the, with the team. So basically, yeah, yeah, they are looking at the great teams, but in the case one of the founders like me fuck up his job of selecting proper partners, then startup-wise guys would help even with, with, the, with the team. So uh, my request is, is simple, uh, eliminate fake news. Uh, you can do that by installing uh, our app, and we're going to release mobile app soon. And uh, we need uh, partners in the PR and the uh, legal services market. We need to reach out to the companies under smear campaigns, trying now to actually inform uh, people online that, well, that was a smear campaign. That was disinformation. That, that was a campaign uh, arranged by our competitor, and now we are, we are trying to solve this. So, install us and help us fuck them all. Thank you. We build Cyax for Businesses. We help organizations who want to upscale the cybersecurity knowledge of their non technical workforce. We let our clients find, track, and improve cybersecurity awareness in one place. We use personalized learning by doing techniques in realistic situations combined with psychological principles, which make SciEx 55% more efficient than traditional solutions. The market will be around 1 trillion euros by 2021. Most of our competitors are focusing only on the black belted cyber ninjas but we are focusing on your non-technical employees. Banks have lots of money, telcos have lots of data, and they are among the most vulnerable sectors, and we aim to tackle them first. We have four pilot projects under negotiations, and we will close this year with 5,000 euro MRR. With the help of Startup Wise Guys, we will change the way how non-technical people are looking at cybersecurity. Cyax's solution will become the norm as part of employee onboarding and training. Join our mission to help people become cyberwise, and let's talk about the potential pilot project. I'm Daniel. I'm from Cyax. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Daniel. Daniel is one of the three Daniels in SciEx in their own company. They have six guys in there, three Daniels. But again, this something baffled me. I was in Telefonica when the WannaCry outbreak happened. And it was amazing how it was caused by somebody clicking on a link and an email. And then the, the result of that was people running inside every floor of Telefonica shouting, unplug your laptops, unplug the printers, unplug everything. And I'm thinking, <coughs> That's it? That's our like, 30 minute response to a cybersecurity attack is to unplug stuff? And that's, so, so, I mean, that's what made me realize that why we might think that cybersecurity training is not cybersecurity. But it is. You know, 95% of your workforce are going to get that email that tells them that their account is, is damaged or they should click on this to download the invoice for their boss. And they're going to click it. Right? Um, and it's far more difficult to protect, you know, <laughs> imagine 130,000 employees, right? So I think that's why we have Kubi who's doing the, you know, the cybersecurity ninjas, 
And then you have sites doing, uh, and, and I see this kind of stuff becoming norm, like health and safety. You go in, you have to do this training. It's an ongoing, I think it's 1% of your time a week, um, on during which you get keep upskilling yourself. And the really cool thing I like about the product is, is vertically aligned. So for telcos, it's a different kind of training. For banks, it's a different kind of training. For energy companies, it's a different kind of training because they have different threats. All right, to our last um, pitch. And our last company, uh, again, these guys have come all the way from, from, from Ukraine. Some say they're from the U.S., but I don't know. I'm yet to figure it out. But they're Estonian in the end. I want to call on stage uh, Yuri from, uh, from IYD. That's the last product, so take it home. Thanks, Rick. All right. Uh, let me tell you a story. So three years ago, me and my co-founder launched our e-commerce startup in the U.S., and that was supposed to be exciting. But a few weeks after we started accepting payments, the first scammer arrived, and that payment was subsequently charged back. As the number of transactions increased, so did the fraudulent activity. And at one point, we were three bad transactions away from going bankrupt. And that, ladies and gents, can break your business and even destroy your lives. E-commerce has seen consistent growth, reaching 18% in 2018 which translates to roughly 400 billion euros in sales. E-commerce fraud, on the other hand, is growing even faster. In fact, nearly twice as fast. And every online retailer, from tiny startups to massive chains, is vulnerable. And the biggest driver behind e-commerce fraud? Data breaches. You might have heard about the recent ones at Facebook or Marriott Hotels. These data that gets stolen is used by hackers to attack retail businesses even years after it's been stolen. My name is Yuri, and this is exactly why we built Hive ID. By providing your customers with a unique digital identity, we empower your business to prevent fraud before it actually happens. Consumers create their identity and verify information about themselves, like email address, phone number, government issued ID, etc. And unlike today, when you do it every time you create an account with Hype ID, you do it only once. Businesses consider data to be gold. But with recent regulations such as GDPR, storing unnecessary information creates huge liability and can actually cost you your business. With Hype ID, you get fully verified, authenticated, and trusted users with no need for complex databases, centralized repositories, or even passwords. So now, any business can concentrate on building frictionless experiences. Imagine, no abandoned cards, no manual reviews, no wrongly declined customers. We build a unified solution unlike anything existing on the market today. We do have competitors in identity management, identity verification, and fraud prevention verticals. But we are above those in a new emerging segment. And many of those companies can actually become our partners or even customers. Our business model is simple. We charge based on monthly active users with subscription plans for volume discounts. The available market is 24 billion euros and is going to grow twice by 2025. And we can go for it because we have a team of passionate computer scientists, cybersecurity professionals, and business geeks. The founders have been working together for the past nine years, and Startup Wise Guys is already backing us on our vision. We need your help in business development. We are looking for customers in the Nordics, Baltics, as well as Western Europe, and we will be raising a seed round in the third quarter this year. So, once again, I'm Yuri, we are Hype ID. Let's have a beer today. Thank you. Thank you, Yuri. All right, then. He had me at no passwords. And also, I've traveled last year, I did 125 flights, and I probably lived in uh, about close to 100 hotels, none of which have my original passport details, or my, my date of birth, or my addresses, because I don't trust giving them that. I don't know who's scanning it. I mean, they have a scan of my passport, and I can't stop them from taking it, but that form they make you fill every time. You don't know where that form is going. You don't know where, who's getting it, how's it getting destroyed. And when he talked to me about this, I was like, man, this is it. Why do, we have to, why do I have to show my passport when I go into a bar to prove that I'm 21? The guy needs to know only my, my date of birth. 
right? And this is the kind of stuff problem that these guys are solving, and I think it's super cool. So these were our seven startups. We have one more that couldn't that couldn't make it, and he's doing um, he's scoring young companies, companies less than two years of age for credit scoring. Um, and the reason for that is because most credit scoring takes into account company data valuations from company reports, which are over two years old. And what they're doing is they're making a proxy from web visitor data uh, using a machine learning algorithm so they can accurately determine whether a company is credit worthy or not by just looking at their, uh, their web, the way people hit their, uh, their websites. They've already scored about 4.3 million of the 5.8 million companies in the UK. So if you're a UK company and you want to know your score, you can go to Scorif, put your company uh, ID in there and it'll give you a score based on how people search for you. Um, and that was it. So um, we're actually opening a B2B SaaS program up in Tallinn in the fall, and we're opening a FinTech program in Vilnius uh, in the fall as well. And both of them applications are open. You can come speak to any of us. You can ask the startups how good, bad, or ugly we are. Um, considering this in the program, it will say we are ugly, and they hate our guts, but such is life. Anyway. Thank you very much for having us. I'm sorry that it took so long, but uh, you know, I love for the startups to kind of have a chat with you. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask them. If you have questions for me, feel free to ask me. Peter, thanks a lot for having us here, and uh, over to you. Thank you for the international yes. of hub for having us here as well. Thank you for it, and thank you for all the amazing companies you bring in. Uh, Hopefully, you will have some good conversation tonight, and that panel also will give you success to to meet partners in Norway. So, thank you. Please uh, stay and have a uh, beer, wine, and some sushi together with us, and uh, have some talks and mingling. Thank you.